This is about reforming a militarized police force that sees communities of color and working class people as all inherently criminal. And we've got to change that. Dr. Beasley, I stand behind you in whatever you want to do. Thank you. And uh, everybody just bear, bear with us. When you have this type of uh, love from folks, folks want to voice their outrage and their concern. Uh, right now, we'll hear from uh, James Gates. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> it is an honor to be here with uh, Dr. Beasley, with all of these uh, courageous and caring uh, individuals. Uh, to reiterate what was said earlier, I'm saddened uh, to be here on such an occasion, but at the same time, I'm honored. And I've prepared some, a brief remark that I wrote out last night uh, about midnight. Upon hearing about the incident that took place between an 82-year-old human rights activist, Mr. Joe Beasley, and an officer or agent of the Atlanta Police Department, I was reminded of those photographs, those images, those pictures that we've all seen from the 50s and the 60s of white police officers terrorizing the descendants of slaves because of the color of their skin. And for too long, here in America and across the world even, we've seen it happen over and over and over again, again, and again. And to me, it actually demonstrates and describes the anguish and the abhorrent attitudes and treatment that black people, black men in particular, have had to endure as their descendants of slaves. The black is bad syndrome is in a reality a symptom or a result of the white is right disease. Mm -hmm. Now with this type of disease or abnormality and symptoms residing within the body of America, it is all but inevitable that we will become sick. For, for far too long here in America and around the world, we have been exchanging love for hate exchanging soul force for monetary force, exchanging faith for folly, exchanging mercy for meanness, exchanging decent, dis, decency for discrimination. And it, it is within this type of framework that an 82-year-old man, human rights activist, that has served Atlanta and America and the world greatly, had a gun put to his head for no reason. To me, this is an example of the modernization of Jim Crowism. This incident and this encounter that took place between Mr. Beasley and that officer, it caused me to see three things. It caused me to see the danger in the vision. Dr. King said we can either Learn to live together as brothers or perish apart as fools. The second thing I saw was the decay that discrimination causes. Nothing good will ever come out of discrimination, for it robs a man of his human dignity, his worth, and his self-value. And I can imagine that when that happened to Dr. Beasley, he felt a sense of hopelessness. Here I am, an 82-year-old man that has served God, served his fellow man, not just black, but white, Jew, Gentile, Protestant, and Catholic. Here in Atlanta and around the country and around the world, I can imagine he felt a sense of hopelessness. But what I want to say in my conclusion, Dr. Beasley, and to every Beasley in Atlanta, to every Beasley in America, and to every Joe Beasley across the world, I come to say there's hope. There's hope because Winston Churchill is right. When going through hell, keep on going. There's hope because Fannie Lou Hamer is right. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. There's hope because this unknown author is right. Don't be discouraged. It's often the last key in the bunch that opens the lock. We have hope because favor your weeding is right. If you should look and see 
that your dream has fallen and broken into a thousand pieces. Never be afraid to pick up one of those pieces and begin again. But my brothers and sisters, we need an infinity of hope, a hope that is eternal, a hope that is everlasting, a hope that cannot be extinguished. And a hope like that, an infinity of hope, can never be built on the words of Winston Churchill, favor your Whedon or any man, no matter how eloquent. A hope that can never be broken, can only be built on the word of God. So I say we have hope because God is right. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. We have a hope that cannot be broken because God said, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We have a hope that is eternal because the apostle Paul is right. Forgetting those things that are behind, pressing forward to those things that are before. But my brothers and sisters, what we need to do today is to let hope ring. Let hope ring from Bankhead to Buckhead. Let hope ring from Cobb County to Fordham County. Let hope ring from the domes and to the dirty bridges to where the homeless free. Let hope ring. And when this happens, we shall speed up that day when all men, black men and white men, Protestant and Catholic, Jews and Gentiles shall be able to join hands and sing in the words of a new Negro spiritual. Hope at last. Hope at last. Hope at last. Thank God Almighty. There's hope at last. Two additional speakers, and then we'll hear briefly from Dr. Beasley in this order. Brother Gerald Rose and Brother uh, Kevin Miles. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, when I first moved to Atlanta, uh, I met Mr. Joe Beasley, Hosea Williams, the Reverend James Orange, and I started my activism in Cobb County. They said, Rose, we deal with issues in, in Fulton County, but Cobb County is on a whole different level. So I started, took it, he took me under his wing. My dad is 80 years old. I see him being arrested in Valdosta, Georgia, taking up handcuffs. Even though he's not blood related, that's my second father. So I want to know we have his back. And one thing what New Order says, not I, but we, because look at this coalition. We're going to fight to the end. Justice will be served. And again, I hope you all to continue to tell the negative side what the police department is doing, because it's unfair. Remember Catherine Johnson? This man is an icon. I was crying with tears when I heard about this because that could have been my father. As you can see, justice will be serving to mayor and to the chief of police. You're on alert. You ask for our vote. Now, when, we, when you get in office, you forget about what the real problem is. But now we're going to make sure we get justice. And, Reb, and um, brother, um, I called you when it first happened. You know what I'm saying? So I love you or whatever. And let's continue to pray for this man. Thank you. Kevin Miles. Uh, good morning. Good morning. I want to start with what, what do we what do we know for certain right now? What we know is that Brother Beasley has spent his entire life out here organizing and doing civil rights and human rights on behalf of everybody. We know that Dr. Beasley was not posing a threat to anybody. That would be inconsistent with his history and his nature. We know that he is an 82-year-old man who was on his way to his office, which is just a block away. So if he was on his way to his office as a lifelong human rights advocate who was posing no threat to an officer, on what grounds did the officer decide that it was justified to pull a weapon and put a weapon in Joe Beasley's face? Ordinarily, we're told that people do that because they felt threatened. But in this case, clearly there was no threat. So I want to co-sign on something that, that Reverend Motley said. What we have is an organizational and a police cultural issue yes. that says that it's acceptable yes. to do this kind of thing to these people in this community because truth be told, if Dr. Beasley was not an international human rights icon, we would not even know this happened. Right. We wouldn't know anything about it. So we have no idea how many times situations right. like this happen in our community because it goes unreported. So, and I'm not, I don't wanna make light of the threat that officers face. Oftentimes, when we criticize an officer for this, we're told, well, you know, we gotta make those split second decisions. That's right. But facts do matter. And I'm gonna tell you something that you won't hear. There are approximately 20 million traffic stops a year in America. 
there are fewer than 200 officers who are killed while executing a traffic stop. Now that doesn't mean that those uh, those deaths are not tragic. I don't want to make light of that. But what I am saying is that the actual threat is less than the threat of being struck by lightning. That's right. Yeah. You are more likely to be struck by lightning than you are to have somebody pull a gun on you while executing a traffic stop, let alone an 82 year old man who is on his way to his office, which is just a block away. Right. So I say all of that to say an apology sounds nice, but it is wholly inadequate. An apology does not address the police cultural issue that led to this incident and the other incidents that we don't even know about. Right. We need, not only do we need a uh, police cultural response, we need a disciplinary response for the officer, and we also need a policy response for the department. Yes. Anything less is insufficient. Yes, sir. Action. Yes, sir. Action. At this point in time, Dr. Beasley will give us some brief words, then we'll take questions. Yeah, just briefly, uh, the police officers that come to the offices of uh, our pastor, Reverend Kenneth Alexander, and he apologized, and I accepted his apology. That does not, uh, however, uh, uh, address the issue. Uh, and so I've consulted uh, uh, with some attorneys uh, because uh, we live in a capitalistic uh, society, mm. and uh, money answers qu many questions. Mm. Uh, but uh, at the bottom line, uh, being a deacon at a church, I, I know that in a scripture that suggests that uh, if you sow to the wind, you'll reap the whirlwind. And I think uh, we live in a world that uh, have sown to the wind, and the whirlwind is coming. Uh, with that, we'll take questions. Dr. Beasley, what would be your response if they don't think that this warrants the officer being terminated? If they comply with the training and the things that we can assume that they're going to comply with, what if they say this isn't enough? To fire Officer Hanson, what would you say? Well, you know, I uh, I love the mayor. She's a wonderful woman, uh, Chief Shields. Uh, but I, I, you know, I this is uh, you know kind of like a universal thing, and uh, uh, I just it's not about me really. <laughs> and uh, it happened to me, and I didn't. I'm a retired police officer myself. 20, 21 <laughs> I've been years. 21 years. <laughs> and I know the use of force. Yes. And uh, the use of force would suggest if you enjoy your firearm, you use it. Mm -hmm. And not only do you, you shoot to kill. And I thought I was a dead piece of meat. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I hope we'll get another line of work. Yeah. <laughs> would you like see. them to release the video? Would you, would you like police to release oh, the video? Absolutely. We've Ab asked them. We're Ab waiting. Absolutely. Uh, and I think it's essential that it be released. Because I know what it will show. It will show this sugar happy young man. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I guess the other side of it, uh, he was white, Caucasian. Uh, that's, and I, I'm with it. Dr. King that says it's not about the color of your skin, but the content of your character. But he was the only one that jumped out and put a gun in my face. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then his colleagues, you know, were black. And my pastor's face trying to justify, justify. that, which is yes, not justifiable. Yes, I was going to say, what did they do? Anything? The other no, officers? No, 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 no. So they were with it. And had I been killed, shot and killed, they would have. Uh, and they can to protect and defend him. Yeah. And I just think it's, uh, you know, not because of me, but for others that they've, uh, you know, every day brutalized. And I would suggest this. Uh, my office is in this community, and I'm, I'm going to be patrolling this community myself. And if I see an officer misbehaving, 
uh, there's going to be a consequence. Thank you. Mm. Last thing, just how many other people do you think this has happened to that don't feel important enough to even report it? Well, I, I think we can't even count the numbers. <laughs> and that's sad indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Beasley, I just have one question. Can you tell us about the emotional toll this incident has taken on you? Well, uh, I haven't been able to sleep well uh, because I have not had a gun pointed in my face since I was in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I was in Vietnam. Uh, in fact, I returned back to Atlanta on the day that Martin Luther King was killed uh, from Vietnam. So this experience with this officer putting that gun in my face, the first time I've been under that kind of uh, situation. Uh, so. Deacon Joe. Cut. Cut. Deacon Joe. Bruce yes. said the same thing happened to him yeah. in this community. Yes. Uh, this happened about 15 years ago. Um, a, a church friend of ours, um, John McCloudy, he was sick, and I was going to uh, visit John. And I came from the north side drive by the church and, and, and came through this neighborhood. And when I came to the neighborhood, I was stopped for no reason at all. And, and the police officer told me to get out of the car. When I got out of the car, I turned around. He had his weapon pointed in my face. He came up to me, grabbed me from behind, pushed me up against the car, handcuffed me. And he only let me go when I started naming some, some, some civil rights icons in the community wow. that I knew. Wow. So I know this happens. I did a report, they, they did their little investigation, but nothing really came of it. And I know they did it because I was in this community and I happened to be black driving that night. So when I heard what happened to my mentor and, and good friend, uh, Dr. Beasley, it just broke my heart and brought back those same memories that I know is true what happened to him because he was driving in this neighborhood, in this community, and they felt they could do whatever they wanted to do to him. Well, you're uh, it, it, as well. Yeah, I'm a member of Antioch as well, so. It, it concludes, I mean, we definitely, we, we all, I think, we're riddled with personal stories of police terrorism here. Uh, so, so just in conclusion, it was a great question about uh, uh, if the mayor uh, or the chief decides not to, uh, we want to make sure it's clear they've already announced that it's an internal investigation. So uh, uh, we're demanding his firing based on the findings of that internal investigation, or, or to, quite, to be quite obvious, just the obvious actions. Uh, two, uh, it, it's come out today that there is body cam footage. I'm glad that the media is requesting it, but councils will also uh, be putting in that request, so there will be another address, and then there will be another address with council. Uh, as it relates uh, to the legal actions. So with that, if there are no more questions, we thank you guys for coming out. And that concludes this press conference.